Databricks has become one of the most important tech companies in the world. With over $3 billion in annual recurring revenue, it's now the one of the largest private tech companies in the world. But what most people don't see is the story behind that growth. A journey that started with a group of researchers at UC Berkeley, an open source project, and the mission to make working with big data a whole lot easier. I'm Dan Williams, I'm a Databricks MVP and the Partner Solutions Architect Champion, and I've been working with Databricks Technologies since early 2017. I actually first heard of Apache Spark in 2016, but I started using it for data analysis a little bit later. Didn't think much about Databricks as a company back then. I just liked the open source product, and I also liked the fact that the creator of Spark, Matei Zaharia, was a Romanian PhD student. Since then, everything grew exponentially and I feel blessed for being on this journey. That's why I created this video. I felt like I needed to go back in time and see how everything started and how we got here. So to really understand how Databricks came to be, we need to go back in time to its academic roots. So when it comes to machines, our goal in the AMB lab is to make data center a real computer. In 2009, big data was quickly becoming a central challenge across industry. And most solutions, mostly Hadoop MapReduce, they weren't keeping up. I mean, these frameworks worked, but they weren't built for that kind of iterative processing that machine learning and analytics workflows actually need. The process was slow and it didn't really scale well when real-time insights were needed. When investigating faster methods for large-scale data processing, Matei Zaharia, Ion Stoika, and their peers began developing an in-memory processing engine. This early prototype of Apache Spark was designed specifically to overcome the latency and efficiency challenges that disk-based computations had issues with. The initial prototype of Spark was written in Scala, and it was designed from the ground up to solve the limitations of these types of systems. Its key innovation was in-memory computing. That means keeping data in memory across distributed systems. It drastically reduced the time it takes to run complex jobs. Matei also introduced RDDs, resilient distributed datasets, which are an abstraction that allowed for resilient and reliable computations. This was a game changer because in 2010, Spark was open source and it didn't take long for the industry to notice. Also, the community around it grew fast. Back then, I had no clue about distributed systems. I was mostly making websites. But anyway, given that Scala runs on the JVM, Spark used this environment to provide the Java API. And by 2012, as the Spark community grew, Java support was getting better and better. Then, around 2013, the Python API, which is known as PySpark, it began to mature. For example, I started with the Python API as my background was in scripting languages and that made it easier for me to adopt Spark. As a side note, about my journey, I got super interested in machine learning in 2015 and I soon realized that Python was just not good enough right, to process big data sets. Spark 2 was already available back then and it helped data scientists like myself to run large-scale computations. Slowly but surely, okay, Spark became the main tool for everything from batch processing to real-time analytics and even machine learning. By 2013, it was clear that there was demand for more than just the Spark engine because organizations love Spark, okay? But managing clusters, deploying code, and maintaining pipelines was still hard. And that's how Databricks got created, a company that was built to make Spark easier to use at scale in the cloud. Behind all of this, okay, was a group of individuals whose vision and expertise helped turn this initial academic prototype into a production-ready engine. Matei Zaharia was at the center of the technical development, but there was also Ion Stoika, a professor and a distributed systems researcher and an early champion of the project. He also provided the foundational thinking around these architectures. Then there was Ali Godzi, who would later become the Databricks CEO. He focused on turning Spark into something that could serve real business needs. And his leadership helped bridge the gap between research and enterprise adoption. Other key contributors were Rain Olksin and Patrick Wendell. They brought deep engineering talent to the table and they helped Spark scale and become more reliable for enterprise use cases. Also, Arsalan Tabakoli Shiraji and Andy Konwinski were crucial in turning early theoretical concepts into practical applications. And together, 
This founding group laid the groundwork for not just a successful open source project, but for something bigger. In 2015, Databricks extended its offering by adding interactive notebooks and collaborative features. These tools allow data scientists, data analysts, and data engineers to work together on data workflows in real time. The proposition actually shifted from simply managing Spark clusters to creating an interactive end-to-end -end data analytics environment. And this move made the platform more appealing to a broader audience. The goal was simple, okay? Abstract away all the infrastructure and help teams get value from that data faster. Then throughout 2016 and 2017, Databricks secured even more funding, which not only expanded the company's workforce and infrastructure, but it also validated its enterprise focus. Now let's look at 2018. Machine learning workflows were very fragmented. Data scientists and data engineers found it hard to track experiments, to package machine learning artifacts, and to actually deploy them. Every company was experimenting with machine learning, but mostly locally, because bringing machine learning models to production was pretty hard, okay? Databricks actually recognized these challenges, and by mid-2018, they launched MLflow. This is an open source framework that streamlines the entire machine learning lifecycle. I'm not going to go into the specifics, but MLflow's design solved these pain points, such as the collaboration between teams and model deployment. And it pretty much paved the way for the concept of MLOps. That's how to bring machine learning models to production using efficient and scalable operations. Listen, prior to 2018, even 2019, okay, nobody was talking about MLOps. Now, all you hear is MLOps, AIOps, LLMOps, you name it. LinkedIn's full of it. MLflow indirectly pioneered this whole industry, and I know it sounds big, but they're truly leading in terms of ML and AI advancement. This move, creating MLflow, I think it marked the company's evolution from a data processing engine into a full analytics platform. While MLflow broadened Databricks' scope to cater for the entire data science workflow, the company recognized that the underlying data storage and the processing systems as well. They needed a similar transformation in order to meet modern enterprise demand. Before 2019, many companies adopted data lakes because they allowed them to store vast amounts of raw, unstructured data. However, this flexibility brought some issues like lack of reliability or fragmented processing between batch and real time. Databricks released Delta Lake in 2019 to try and solve these problems. At a high level, okay, Delta Lake is a storage optimization layer that sits on top of existing data lakes. It introduced quite a few technical innovations, and I'm not going to dive into all of these, but the most important one, at least in my opinion, is acid transactions in data lakes. This guarantees that multiple operations can be performed at the same time, without actually risking data corruption. This is so normal nowadays that people forget the importance of it. The concept existed for a long time, but in relational databases. So bringing this innovation to data lakes, together with the fact that you can run both batch and real-time streaming operations, makes it huge in terms of data architectures. Now, throughout 2020, Databricks continued to refine its unified platform. They brought enhancements to the Delta engine, and they made tighter integrations across its ecosystem. They created a lot, and I mean a lot of marketing materials, webinars, and documentation around the fact that the Lakehouse architecture enables a full analytics lifecycle. And companies could just ingest raw data, run complex transformations, perform machine learning, and generate real-time reports all within the same platform. And I think the success of their own marketing efforts, actually, this actually led to the increased competition that we see nowadays. They simply invented this new paradigm that a lot of companies are just following now. What is the Lakehouse architecture? It combines the flexibility of data lakes with the performance of data warehouses, adding tools like Delta Lake for reliable storage, MLflow for managing machine learning life cycles, and notebooks for cross-functional teams, and you start to see how the early innovation of Spark how it actually scaled into a full platform that supports some of the largest data-driven organizations in the world. By 2021, as more enterprises adopted the Lakehouse model, Databricks enhanced security, governance, and performance features in order to meet the demands of these large organizations. 
they created strong partnerships with major cloud providers such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, and they integrated Lakehouse solutions directly into their cloud offerings, especially their partnership with Azure. It helped drive further both market trust and they expanded Databricks's reach. I primarily use Azure Databricks and I somewhat specialized in Databricks on Azure rather than AWS or GCP. So their tight integration actually helped both myself and others to become Databricks specialists. Due to this successful partnership, analysts and a lot of industry experts began to cite the Lakehouse as a disruptive innovation. It set a new standard for both unified data management and analytics. And since 2021, people actually started hearing about it more and more, and this just grew exponentially. But what's next? Is the Lakehouse architecture good enough? Is it complete and mature? Or is it missing something? Looking back now, it was obvious, right? But the missing piece was unified governance. The Lakehouse architecture had proven itself. It could handle massive data volumes. It could unify workloads across engineering, data science and analytics, and it could reduce the complexity of managing multiple systems. But one big question remained. Is the Lakehouse architecture complete? Is it truly enterprise ready? Until that point, governance was fragmented. Data was spread across cloud object stores, delta tables, and different workspaces. Permissions were often managed inconsistently. Catalogs lived in silos, and organizations had to stitch together access control, auditing, and data lineage across multiple tools. That meant security risks, compliance headaches, and more friction for teams who were just trying to collaborate on the same data. That's where Unity Catalog came in. Databricks launched it in 2022, and Unity Catalog was built to address these exact problems that I mentioned. A single unified governance layer for all data and AI assets across your entire Databricks landscape. In essence, Unity Catalog completed the Lakehouse vision. It connected the dots between performance, scalability, and now governance. It gave companies the confidence to move critical workloads to Databricks because now it delivered on the most difficult parts, which are trust and control. In 2023, 2024, and 2025, Databricks continued to invest in new capabilities, AI and machine learning integrations, and enhanced data and AI governance. And there are so many partnerships and so many tools that are being launched on a monthly basis that I literally cannot mention everything in just one video. But due to the speed of innovation, I think they will make sure that the Lakehouse model remains at the forefront of modern data architectures. Nowadays, you have a lot of competition from many big players. Historically, it's been Snowflake, okay? But in the last years, Microsoft saw the opportunity and they created Fabric as an end-to-end -end unified analytics platform. You see many competitors following Databricks' footsteps and they're all adopting similar concepts. Probably because Databricks already sold the vision so well that they can just ride that way. I think this can be worrisome to a certain extent if we assume that innovation just stops here. But that's impossible. I think innovation is the moat that Databricks has and the integrations in AI, the partnerships and the acquisitions that they make. Yes, competition will get stronger. They might even eat into some margins, but the next years will bring new paradigms and Databricks doesn't disappoint. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you want me to dive deeper into any aspect of the Databricks platform, let me know down in the comments. Also, if you liked what you heard, please like, share and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.